to the presentation of the 2021 Review of Maritime Transport Report. And according to the authors, the true flagship of ANCTAD. My name is Shamika Siriman. I'm the director of the Technology and Logistics Division of ANCTAD. You may know that 80% of the global trade in goods is carried on ships. The maritime transport system is a complex web of ship builders, ship owners, shippers, freight forwarders, seafarers, shipping lines of various kinds, the containers, the dry bulk tankers. Then you have ports, the port authorities, port regulators, customs and immigration authorities, marine environmental agencies, and all sorts of service providers and more. And when things are going well, we take this complex system for granted. But when things go wrong, they can go really very wrong. And this is exactly what happened in March when Ever Given, one of the biggest ships in the world got stuck sideways in the Suez Canal. Repercussions were huge and they were immediate because the Suez Canal handles 12% of global seaborne trade. The blockage disrupted over 9 billion worth of goods every single day. And then of course, many more MEMS were born on this occasion. So you have some of these things quite uh, related to our own lives. And a lot more is happening on MEMS front. And in some countries, there were even songs made for the ever given uh, accident. Then we experienced the COVID-19 induced historically high freight rates, threatening the nascent recovery of the global economy. And still this threat looms high as you can see from that graph. So the RMT 2021 presents these developments, analyze their impacts, especially on developing countries and presence a set of recommendations for the short-term recovery and medium-term policy measures to future-proof the maritime transport sector. And today we have a most eminent panel to discuss the state of play, share good practices and lessons and charter the way forward for the global maritime. The key messages of the RMT will be presented by Ms. Gre Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General of UNCTAD. Then we will hear from His Excellency Moon Seong Gyok, Minister of Oceans and Fisheries of Republic of Korea. His Excellency Alan Ganu, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Regional Cooperation and International Trade of Mauritius. His Excellency Eduardo Sperison, Guatemala's ambassador to the WTO, His Excellency Mr. Chad Blackman, ambassador of Barbados to the United Nations, and Professor Cleopatra Dumbia Henry, president of the World Maritime University and a long-standing friend of the Review of Maritime Transport Report. So thank you so much for being with us, all of you. Hopefully we will have some time for Q&A via the chat function. So please post your queries on the chat. My colleague Jan Hoffman, who is the head of the trade logistics of UNCTAD and the team leader of RMT will facilitate the Q&A. So without much ado, let me give the floor to our secretary general. SG, you have the floor. SG, you are muted. Do you hear me now? Yeah, very good. Good. So thank you very much, Shamika. Let me uh, take this opportunity to greet the excellencies, the excellent panelists that we are going to have afterwards, and all the excellencies that are here with us today, and to all UNCTAD uh, uh, colleagues, good morning. Really, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today, launching our flagship publication, the UNCTAD Review of Maritime Transport 2021. 
As you know, this is our oldest flagship publication. Since 1968, we have covered crucial statistics on maritime trade, the world shipping fleet, freight rates, ports, the regulatory framework, etc. Every time we launch this re report, we have a great deal of media attention. But this year, <laughs> this has been even higher. You know that <laughs> uh, this report has break all the records that we had before. We are in the midst of an unprecedented crisis in maritime trade, as Shamika was saying before. We are seeing profound changes in consumer patterns, in global supply chains, in energy markets, in poor turnaround times, in freight rates, all of it really reconfiguring the logistics of trade. Shipping has been constantly in the news headlines this year. From the ever given incident at the Suez Canal in March uh, that Chamika was referring to, to what's happening now in the Los Angeles port. But often this crisis is portrayed in simple terms. A recent headline read, and I quote, supply chain issues will ruin Christmas. The reality, as our report shows, is much deeper and more worrying than that. What's at stake is not just a holiday season. It is food insecurity. It is inflation. It is a long-term challenge for developing countries in general and for small island developing states in particular. Let me therefore go straight ahead and mention some of the key data and insights that we have included in this year's report. Maritime trade contracted 3.8% in 2020, reflecting the initial shock of the COVID-19 the COVID pandemic. This year, it has rebounded, and we project an increase of 4.3%. For the medium term, we predict that growth between now to 2026 will slow to 2.4% annually compared to 2.9 of the last two decades. These numbers are very revealing. When we put them in context, maritime trade both contracted more than the world GDP last year and is expected to rebound less than world GDP this year. What this shows is that maritime trade is more elastic in the downside than to the upside. It is much easier to cancel a shipment than to build a new ship. On the supply side in 2020, the global commercial shipping fleet grew by around 3%. During 2020, delivery of ships declined by 12%, partly due to lockdown-induced labor shortages that disrupted marine industrial activity, as we all know. Now in 2021, new orders have surged but as it takes two to three years to build new ships, this growth in new orders will take time to have an impact on the supply capacity. So let me turn to freight rates, an area of great concern to all in many markets because freight rates, most notably in the container shipping segment, have reached historical heights. On many roads, today's freight rates are four to five times higher than the average 
over the previous decade, despite the declining that we have seen in the last days. One of the great insights of our report is a simulation we do on the effect of freight rates on price levels. Our simulation shows that global consumer price levels may increase by an additional 1.5% as a result of current increased maritime transport costs. This is huge. This is a huge impact at the global level in, an aver in average terms. But if we go, for example, to the small island developing states, what we have is that the, is that the impact if, is five times higher. That means that according to our projections, small island developing states could have an impact of 7.5% additional inflation because of the increase in freight rates. This is a cause of great concern for food security. According to FAO, the world's food import bill, including shipping costs, is projected to reach $1.75 trillion dollars in 2021. This is 12% more than 2020. Developing regions account to 40% of this bill, 40% of this bill, and are expected to see it rise by nearly 20% in 2021. This is the fastest increase on record. So behind this high in freight rates, we found dynamics in both the demand side and the supply side. On the demand side, growing e-commerce and economic stimulus packages have put additional pressure on carriers and ports, shifting supply patterns towards good goods instead of services. In countries where consumer demand has been stable this, despite the COVID-19 downturn, in the US, for example, the money that couldn't be spent on restaurants and cinema is being spent on furniture, electronics, and so on. Nominal demand for US consumer goods is now 20% above pre-COVID levels. On the supply side, the pandemic has slowed down operations at all levels. A container spends today 20% more time in the system, and ships and trailers are held up in congested ports. This means that de facto, we would need more transport capacity for the same level of trade adding fuel <laughs> and fire to the problem. As port operators and transport providers have introduced measures to contain COVID-19, ships must spend more time in ports that are operatingly more slowly, more slowly, they go more slowly. The greatest delays are for dry break bulk carriers for which cargo operations tend to be less automated and more labor intensive. The crisis so exacerbated, is exacerbated by limited capacity in the world's seaports. Port infrastructure investments take years to plan and undertake, as we all know. So at short notice, little can be done. What this also means is that the port infrastructure we have today is dealing with the demand it thought it was going to meet in three years, in five years, in 10 years ago. So we have prepared for what we projected three, five or 10 years ago. No one, including us at ANTAT, could have expected the situation we have now. 
So to change what we have projected takes time because it takes time to expand the infrastructure and to build the ships and equipment we need. Our report also delves deeper into the issue of turnaround times and how they differ significantly between countries, producing economies of scale in those countries with large and efficient ports, in detriment of those with low levels of digitalization and inadequate infrastructure. These inequalities are also behind the transport costs that some countries in the developing world are currently facing. In general, as we have pointed out in previous reports, more maritime trade means more economies of scale. That means larger ships and fewer ports and more market concentration. This is what we are seeing. And this also has an effect on prices. I could go on and on. There is a true wealth of information and statistics in this report, too much to include all the data in this presentation. But allow me to draw your attention to some novel sections and data sets that we have included in this year's issue. We have included a new section on trade facilitation, where we also appreciate the contribution of the International Maritime Organization, with special thanks to Mr. Kitak Lim, who is with us here on this panel. Thank you very much to you, sir, and to the organization for this contribution. So a number of new tables have enriched our analysis, including key performance indicators for dry bulk and tanker port operations the commercial value of the shipping fleet and effective freight rates based on contract on contract rates. These are unique new data sets, which we plan to continue updating in future issues of the review and that we are sure are very handy for all the industry and the analysts of these issues. Lastly, a special chapter on the seafarer crewing crisis assesses what needs to be done to help our seafarers, many of whom are confined to remain in their ships far beyond what is humanly acceptable. I would like to personally highlight our appreciation and thanks to the seafarers of this world without whom all of us would not have the food, the medical supplies and the consumer goods that reach us from overseas in these critical times. Your excellencies, dear friends, before finishing, allow me to highlight three final conclusions and policy recommendations. First, the current supply chain crisis is not yet over. There is no single silver bullet on the horizon to solve the ongoing crisis, but policymakers can support shippers and transport providers through a number of measures to ease the situation. It is important, therefore, to advance urgent investments in soft and hard transport infrastructure. Governments need to advance reform and digitalize procedures. Custom automation, pre-arrival data processing, port call optimization, and other digital solutions all help to speed up port and custom handling. Second, seafarers need and, and merit our continued support. We thank and appreciate the initiative taken by the government of Indonesia. And I specifically salute His Excellency Minister Sumadi, who is here with us today. 
to successfully submit a resolution by the United Nations General Assembly to assign key worker status to seafarers. We support the implementation of this urgent resolution, vaccinate seafarers as key workers, please. In our review, we also provide a list of seven actions that need to be taken by different stakeholders. They comprise vaccination, crew changes, the implementation of existing instruments, maritime single windows, road deviation, information exchange, and better preparation for future outbreaks and emergencies at sea. All this needs more coordination and more cooperation between countries. Third, and lastly but not least, I urge governments and the international community to support a predictable multilateral framework for maritime transport decarbonization. We need to avoid unnecessarily high costs, especially for the, for the vulnerable economies. And investors need a clear, a clear picture so that investments in new vessels, technologies, ports, and energy generation and distribution are not delayed. This is all for now. Dear friends, I want to thank Shamika and her team and everyone that has been involved in this fantastic and important report. I look forward to the upcoming panel where many of the themes I have highlighted, I'm sure will be discussed. I thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, SG. Thank you very much for unpacking the complexity of the shock in the maritime transport sector, both on the demand side and on the supply side, and highlighting the repercussions beyond just you know, uh, 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 destroying our holidays. This is a much bigger than that on the inflation and on the food security issues, and also bringing in the, you know, what needs to be done in the short term and what are the steps that the maritime sector needs to take in the medium to long term. So thank you so much. And I think you really set the stage for the rest of the discussion. So let me now invite His Excellency Moon Siong Hyok, Ministry, Minister of Oceans and Fisheries of the Republic of Korea. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Madam Secretary General Rebecca Greenspan, Director Ms. Shamika Siriman, Dr. Cleopatra Dumbia Hanni, the Madam President of World Maritime University, my old friend, Dr. Jan Hoffman, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning in Switzerland and very good evening from the Republic of Korea. I am Song Young Moon, Minister of Oceans and Fisheries of the Republic of Korea. First of all, please allow me to extend my belated congratulations to Secretary General, Ms. Rebecca Greenspan for assuming office last September. I hope that your distinguished leadership and the competence as previously demonstrated on the global stage will greatly help us achieve prosperity for all. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Cleopatra Dumbia Henley, the president of World Maritime University. WMU has a special place in my heart as this is the place where I taught the students before taking office at the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries of Korea. Even though the COVID-19 pandemic has prevented us from meeting in person, it gives me great joy to see you, albeit virtually. And I'd like to take this opportunity to offer my sincere congratulations on the publications of a 2021 review of a maritime transport, which is in brief RMT. My utmost respect goes to the Secretary's commitment 
and dedication to publishing RMT every year for more than five decades since 1968. For this year's RMT, I hope to highlight three areas that I believe warrant a particular attention and would like to walk you through the Korean government's measures relevant to each area. First, I'd like to begin by recognizing chapter three, which analyzes impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on shipping rates and global economy. I believe that this chapter provides very clear directions for countries to improve the shipping and the logistics sector. While the global shipping volume has shown sharp increases since the second half of last year, ports that primarily relied on human resources saw their productivity decline, which in turn translated into the disruption in global supply chain and even higher shipping rates. The global shipping industry responded with surges in demand for new vessels in 2021. And by the time they are delivered in 2023, we expect that more balance will be brought to the supply and the demand. With these new vessels, which include the mega ships, being in service en masse, there will be changes to the supply chain and adjustments in shipping rates in the container market. On the flip side, however, as this could also potentially entail side effects such as market inequality and the shipping rate plunge. Global shipping companies and the international community should work together in order to guard against these unintended offshoots through, for example, supply adjustments. In doing so, we must put in a great deal of efforts to strengthen the resilience of the supply chain. In this sense, the COVID-19 pandemic could spur the introduction and proliferation of smart ports. For my part, the Korean government is focusing on building smart ports, which are in essence, digitalized and unmanned ports. We set up port automation test beds in the ports of Gwangyan, Korea by 2026, and plan to put in operation so-called the K-Smart port, which is the second new port of Busan, Korea from 2030. Digitalization and automation may be faced with possible backlash from port workers, of course. In order for us to buffer them from these rapid changes, I believe that it is necessary to suggest a way forward to engage them by preparing retraining programs for existing port workers and the training schemes for new workers suited to smart ports. Second, I'd like to mention how COVID-19 has left the seafarers vulnerable to the aftermath. As the global spread of COVID-19 prolonged the travel restrictions and the lockdowns across the world, those who work on board ships often got strapped in. While this is a serious human rights issue for seafarers, this can also deter sustainable development of global seaborne trades. In this regard, crew changes must be freely allowed in all ports. However, it is quite concerning to hear that some countries have been restricting such crew changes with the outbreak and the spread of new strains of COVID-19. Korea has been operating dedicated seafarer quarantine facilities under the guidance of the health authorities to guarantee 
three crew changes while ensuring their safety and health. We must make it clear that three crew changes are the least we can do for seafarers' human rights. And the international community and major countries should actively voice their advocacy for free crew changes in all countries around the world. Last but not least, I'd like to highlight the reviews warnings on rising sea levels due to climate change, which will have a huge impact on ports across the globe. Currently, the European Union as well as the International Maritime Organization are discussing various regulations to decarbonize the shipping industry. On the global stage, Korea is continuing in earnest to the discussions in IMO and its MEPC meetings by lending its voices. At home, Korea will be investing $200 $20 million in green ship technology development so that zero carbon ships can be commercialized by 2050. However, when it comes to global discussions on these environmental regulations, I'd like to emphasize that international consensus must come first. In the process of implementing environmental regulations, there will be inevitable reduction to freight spaces coupled with the shipping rate increases. This could accelerate the collapse of a small and medium-sized shipping companies. Moreover, as IMT rightly puts it, this could pose even greater burden on developing countries. Madam Secretary General and the speakers, the entire world is under the scourge of the double whammy of COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. However, it is developing countries with a lower resilience, especially small island developing states and least developed countries who are left with a disproportionate burden. As this year's successful 15th regular session of UNCTAD, reminded us through its theme from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all. The international community must work together to build a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable shipping industry where developing countries are invited to play their important roles. In July this year, Korea became the first country to be upgraded onto the developed economy group from the developing group since the establishment of ANTA. We are once a colonized and least developed country born out of the ashes of a war. But we have walked the untreaded path to become a developed country will tap on the capacity we built through trade and industrialization to overcome global crises along with the developing countries. And we'll cooperate even more closely with UNCTAD, a leading force for global co-prosperity and cooperation. Before I close, I really hope that UNCTAD and the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries of Korea can join our hands more tightly going forward. And I'd like to wish you all the best, happiness, and among others, good health. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you for your very insightful remarks and you told us how uh, South Korea is future-proofing the maritime sector. You talk about digitalization, automation, smart ports, green shipping, and thank you. And I think it, there is a, a lot of it in that coming together, tight relationship to take the amazing experience that you have to the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
Now let me turn to. I think it's everybody can mute their uh, um, mics. That will be good. Okay, let me now invite His Excellency Alan Ganu, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Regional Cooperation and International Trade of Mauritius. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Madam Secretary General, colleague ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me at the outset to convey my best wishes to Her Excellency Rebecca Greenspan, whom I had the chance to meet recently at Geneva in the margin of our trade policy review, the new UNCTAD Secretary General and commend her organization on this flagship report on the review of Maritime Transport 2021. The report provides a thorough understanding of the structural and cyclical changes affecting seaborne trade, ports, and shipping. This year's special focus on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the industry and on small island developing states will prove invaluable in a concerted effort to curtail challenges and negative impacts on the pandemic. The report comprehensively highlights that global economic output fell by 3.5% and merchandise trade by 5.4% by four, by four, by in 2020, while international maritime shipments fell by 3.8%. Even though the international maritime trade and global supply chains were severely hit by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the report underscores that the short-term outlook was positive while the medium-term and longer-term prospects remain uncertain. We are pleased to note that the UNCTAD expects world maritime trade to, re to recover by 4.3% in 2021. The future growth of the sector will nevertheless be closely associated by the path of the pandemic and the associated lockdowns and restrictions. We, have a, we however know from the report, the world of caution, whereby the emerging recovery is inherently fragile as many countries and regions continue to lack. This vulnerability is closely associated with a sharp increase in freight rates since the second half of the half of 2020. If this is sustained, the higher container freight rates will significantly increase both import and consumer prices. Dear colleagues, we are deeply concerned by the UNCTAD's prediction that the hardest hit will be SIDS, who depend primarily on maritime transport in view of their remoteness and who according to UNCTAD's simulation model will in addition face a cumulative increase in import prices of 24% within one year. The surge in container freight rates will add to production costs, which will have serious impacts on consumer prices, which is expected to rise by 7.5%. This would undeniably have been devastating consequences on SIDS economies where merchandise imports constitute a significant contribution to their GDP, around, which is around 58%. It will seriously erode their comparative advantages on which foundation most of their trade exchanges are built. Excellencies, Mauritius as a SIDS is heavily dependent on maritime transport for international trade and transportation plays a crucial role in the economic and re regional development of a country. Port Louis Harbor is the principal gateway of Mauritius where 99% of our external trade is handled. 
Sadly, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the existing challenges faced by Mauritius maritime trade are further increased. Challenges such as labor shortages and infrastructure needs that, have, that already existed in the maritime industry before the pandemic have been further exposed and magnified. It has had a major impact on global shipping, affecting all shipping sectors from passenger ships to container ships and oil tankers. The pandemic has also affected the flow of cargo, port calls, and the level of liner shipping connectivity. We, however, take good note from the UNCTAD report that Mauritius is the only seeds country where ships of more than 14,000 TUs are handled and there has not been much disruption in the maritime connectivity and cargo handling in port during the pandemic, but challenges remain. And the dynamic nature of the evolution of the pandemic may suddenly bring major disruptions in the capacity of Mauritius to cope with the situation. Excellencies, as mentioned earlier, the impact of the pandemic was less severe on maritime trade volumes in 2020 than initially expected but the knock-on effects will be far-reaching and could trans transform maritime transport. Other impacts of the pandemic were on the seafarers themselves, caused by travel restrictions imposed by governments around the world. Crew changes and repatriation of seafarers became more difficult, causing a humanitarian crisis and significant concerns for the safety of the seafarers and the ships. Mauritius was no exception whereby seafarers have been collateral victims of the crisis, as travel restrictions and border closures have left tens of thousands of them stranded on ships or unable to join their ships. Among those to be repatriated was a flight of 2,352 Mauritian seafarers scattered all around the globe and who were engaged on international voyages on board these cruise vessels. Excellencies, with the impact of the pandemic still lingering on our economies, it was expected that seaborne trade, including containerized trade, would experience a strong downturn. But on the contrary, the pandemic has triggered a change in the consumption and shopping patterns, with a surge in electronic commerce caused by lockdown measures, thus leading to an increase in import demand for manufactured consumer goods. The Mauritian government is fully supportive, supportive of the efforts being undertaken by international institutions, such as the IMO, the WTO, and UNCTAD itself, which are at the forefront of ship safety and security, trade multilateralism, and we hope that concrete solutions are proposed to address the maritime transport problems. Your Excellencies, I would like to use this opportunity to propose the following reflections and how maritime transport could be improved in the context of the pandemic. One, maritime and port connectivity is an indication of good network connection in terms of transport for effective and efficient movement of cargo, whereby the port functions as an interchange between the road, the rail, and the maritime transportation modes. However, connectivity is not all as seaports should continuously invest to, um, to upgrade the facilities they provide to keep pace with the ever-growing size of ships. Secondly, to attract more vessels and remain in business, ports should be able to accommodate larger ships and provide better cargo handling facilities to, to handle more volumes. It is to be noted that one of the biggest impediments for Mauritius and countries of the Indian Oceans region is the lack of a regional shipping line to provide feeder services in the region. Thirdly, it is also crucial that we improve trade tracking and forecasting. Monitoring of port calls, liner schedules must be improved and tracing and port call optimization must be enhanced. Fourthly, countries must obtain assistance for trade procedures to be streamlined, modernized and digitalized, reducing the physical contact between workers in the shipping industry, whilst at the same time keeping ports open and cross-border trade flowing. We need to enable trade to continue in a safer manner through pandemics and other crises. 
Fifthly, for SIDS, it is important to explore the possibility of regimes whereby liner shipping connectivity is not further undermined and the international community must aim to promote, promote sustainable domestic and inter-regional shipping solutions. Uh, sixthly, they also need to be in the, they also need to the international community to come up with financing schemes for more efficient and sustainable shipping services and strategies for small scale inter-regional and island trade opportunities. Lastly, as regard clean technology and mitigating the risk associated with technology transitions, there is need, a need for substantial investment in African countries, in developing countries, and since innovative, in innovative financing mechanisms such as blended finance, green finance, and climate bonds. As far as Mauritius is concerned, I believe that improvement in maritime connectivity with our main trading partners will contribute to the economic growth of Mauritius. However, to improve maritime connectivity, facilities being offered in the port region should be improved. And we should negotiate with shipping lines to have more calls in Mauritius. Excellencies, as far as Mauritius as a regional hub is concerned, I wish to inform that the port of Mauritius is already positioned as a transshipment hub port in the Indian Ocean, but the infrastructure and superstructure available is unfortunately still not enough to render the services more competitive and attract shipping line to have more ship calls. Due to limited space in the port area, a good planning, upgrade and relocation of certain activities is vital. To conclude, more investment should be made in the port to accommodate more ships alongside KS at one time, improve services through the digitization process and increase the container handling rate. Additionally, storage space for transshipment of cargoes should be increased. I have done uh, your excellencies and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you for very uh, insightful remarks. And you highlighted the challenges for SIDS. And this is something that we have said in our report in terms of inflation, rising food prices, and you highlighted labor shortages, infrastructure difficulties, and extremely important that these seven recommendations that you have put forward as we charter the way forward for the maritime transport sector. So we will be reaching out to work with you more as we uh, you know, go uh, forward. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, let me now turn to His Excellency Eduardo Sperison, Guatemala's ambassador to the WTO. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Shalikasi Madam Secretary General, Director Greenspan, Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and good evening to all. I would like first to thank Ma Madam Secretary General for her rem opening remarks and to the Division of Technology and Logistics of Compton for the organization of the event and for the preparation of the publication. The review of maritime transport is a unique publication that provides important data analysis and trends on maritime transport from a global perspective. Therefore, it is an honor for me to participate in the launch of the event and of the publication. In particular, because the COVID-19 had a great impact in maritime transport and logistics, and we need the data, analysis, and policy options to overcome those challenges. Looking at the content and topics presented in the 2021 publication. I recognize that this information is timely as it reflects in a clear manner the, the effects of COVID-19 has had on the maritime transport around the world. From our national perspective, our exporters and importers have already voiced their great concern around the overwhelming increase in the maritime cost and this report explains the main elements 
that are causing this rise of prices. We note the simulation made that shows that the impact of container freight rate would increase 10.6% the input price levels, and as a result, increased 1.5% in consumer price levels worldwide. The report reveals that the economic impact of high container freight rates is affecting particularly or to small and vulnerable economies. This effect can slow national economies that already are under pressure due to the pandemic. Although this sudden peak of prices was a result of unexpected high demand of maritime transport during the pandemic of the COVID-19, it is evident that we need to work on a more resilient logistics and maritime transport system. The report also suggests some policy consideration for building resilience and avoiding future crises. And we definitely believe that ONTAP and member states should continue discussing these policy considerations in order to find the appropriate solutions. For example, the report rightly highlights that the upward trajectory in freight rates have recent concerns about the market behavior and transport transparency in the freight pricing. We are particularly interested in exploring whether this, this situation has been exacerbated by greater market concentration and whether governments around the world should take measures to avoid such concentration. We also take note of the importance of improving structural factors such as port infrastructure, quality, trade facilitation, environment, and shipping connectivity in order to reduce costs. I would like to mention that we find particularly important that Compact continues its work on measuring international maritime trade and port traffic, as well as the short and long-term trends. We also like to commend the work of that Ontap is jointly doing with the World Bank on transport cost data set. And we encourage to continue the report on the collected data so that developing countries may have a better understanding on the source of these costs and how to reduce them. Data presented in the maritime profile of our countries is a useful and simple way to understand the status of our countries regarding shipping connectivity, port handling performance, and greenhouse emissions, and encourage UNTA to continue working these profiles and build on information collected by the new database. As Central American region, we are working on several trade facilitation initiatives, and we believe that data and information collected and presented by UNTA is useful to guide regional efforts into effective transport and trade facilitation policies. We look forward on the continuation of work with UNTA on these issues. And once again, congratulations of the publication. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And thank you very much for highlighting the need to build a resilient maritime sector you talk about infrastructure and also the institutional uh, reforms like trade facilitation and we take uh, a, a good note of what you ask about the greater market concentration in the shipping sector and what it means for the for the developing countries this is something that we are studying now thank you very much so let me now turn to his excellency mr chad blackman ambassador of barbados to the un Ungtan Secretary General, Heads of Government, Honorable Ministers, President of the World Maritime University, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a negative impact on global trade. Although global trade in goods, 
has rebounded over the last few months to reach record-breaking pre-pandemic levels. The impact of the pandemic is likely to be felt for some time into the future. The 2021 edition of the UNCTAD Review of Maritime Transport not only gives a clear perspective of the impact that the pandemic has had on maritime transport, but on how changes in the global maritime transport architecture will impact on trade and on economies globally. The review concretizes much of what we already knew as small island developing states that our dependence on trade and by extension maritime transport will be central to how we maneuver to adapt our engagement in global and regional supply and value chains and the transformation of our maritime trade patterns. Global trade is heavily dependent on maritime transport to move goods between countries. The measures employed by a number of countries across the world to limit the spread of the pandemic, including but not limited to export restrictions, lockdowns and border closures contributed to a drastic fall in trade volumes in 2020. The 2021 review has however revealed that by the end of the year, trade volumes had rebounded already, thereby paving the way for shifts in global supply chains and new maritime trade patterns. The sustainability of recovery will to a greater extent be dependent on the duration of the pandemic itself. Vaccine equity coupled with low vaccine rates and the development of new variants and waves of infections have severely impacted efforts by individual countries to contain the pandemic and has led to a new wave of new lockdowns and border closures. Global recovery is contingent on a large-scale global vaccine program, hitherto given greater impetus to the refrain, no one is safe until everyone is safe. The benefits therefore redounding not only to benefits on the health and sanitary side, but also from an economic perspective. In this regard, the review equates a global rollout of vaccines as tantamount to a large-scale economic stimulus package that could accelerate economic recovery and by 2025 generate some $9 trillion in additional global output. The global community must therefore seek an urgent global solution to vaccine inequity by ensuring that all countries have equal and affordable access to the COVID-19 vaccines and other therapeutics if global recovery is to be sustainable. The pandemic has also exacerbated the peculiar challenges faced by SIDS particularly as they relate to trade connectivity, including their high dependence on external trade, insularity, high transport costs, food insecurity, infrastructure gaps, diseconomies of scale, and lack of access to finance. The report reveals that a staggering 37 small island economies are included among the 50 least connected economies. Experience taught us that countries with low connectivity do not generate the volume of trade that would encourage the frequent services that are needed to better connect the overseas markets. This, however, has not necessarily been the case for a select few SIDS increasing liner shipping connectivity indices because they have developed into regional hubs, attracting transshipment, <clears throat> containerized trade for other countries. They are therefore in a better position to offer their own importers and exporters better access to overseas markets. Additionally, experience has also shown that small players, small and developing states, are not the decision makers when it comes to dictating transport routes, thereby limiting their ability to trade with neighboring countries if they are not the owners of maritime transport liners. Despite the rebound in trade in volumes in 2020, the disruptions in shipping and logistics, shortages in container equipment and port congestion has resulted in increase in freight rates, surcharges and fees, including demurrage and detention fees. The fluctuations in port calls coupled with small cargo sizes and difficulty, scarcity in container equipment since the advent of the pandemic has also had a debilitating impact on maritime transport and access to supply chains for SIDS. Now, in light of their size, smaller shippers with small cargo sizes like those destined to and from SIDS may find it more difficult to secure contracts and to absorb these additional costs. Increase Import and container freight rates are causing considerable fears amongst smaller economies, given the likelihood that such increases can drive up consumer prices. The 2021 review states that if container freight rates remain at their current high levels, global consumer prices are projected to increase by 1.5% higher than they would have been without the freight rate surge in 2023. However, for smaller and developing states, that are highly dependent on imported goods for consumption and the inputs in the tourism sector, the impact 
is likely to be debilitated. Hometab forecasts that the increase in consumer prices is likely to be around 7.5% in SIDS. The severity and urgency of this matter calls for urgent government intervention. However, and a big however, virgin in debt levels and limited fiscal space limit the types of intervention that SIDS can take. Targeted policy recommendations and a set of support measures for these countries uh, to ensure sustainable and resilient recovery in the maritime sector must be at the forefront of an UNCTAD response to smaller and developing states. And in closing, UNCTAD's work in maritime transport has proven to be indispensable, and the 2021 review maritime is by no mean an exception. As countries seek to enhance their climate adaptation commitments, they will amend the regulatory requirements and align shipping operations with decarbonization targets in the International Maritime Organization. UNCTAD foresees that such regulations could have a negative impact on the continued access of SIDS to maritime transport. UNCTAD must be entrusted uh, to continue to research and, and analyze uh, such measures by working with the IMO and advise on SIDS so as to ensure that the related impact of these new regulations on their economies are fleshed out. This is a type of transformation that is needed in the agenda moving forward, and one where it is key on the issues of international agenda, which impact on developing countries, particularly those that are the most vulnerable amongst us and the beneficiaries within its mandate are taken up certainly then by the organization. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just also want to highlight something that all of you have been saying, the need to vaccinate the world and its seafarers. In fact, this is the priority number one that we have highlighted in the report. We say with the support of dedicated funds, such vaccination will not just accelerate the end of the pandemic, but it will rebalance the demand towards more services and less for, the, uh, for goods and also add trillions to the global economic output. So this is a really a win-win situation. And if you don't vaccinate the world's population, we will live through this crisis for a, you know, for, for a while to come. So let me now turn to Professor Cleopatra Dumbia Henry, the president of the World Maritime University uh, for her remarks. Good. Good morning and thank you very much for uh, having me and joining this very interesting discussions that uh, have started since morning. Um, I really want to focus on the CPRs, who in my view, of course, have been, uh, it's, uh, have been one of the target groups that in, in fact, as, you, as said, by out, out of sight, out of mind and who are exposed to the daily uh, challenges of being at sea and ensuring that we all receive the goods and uh, necessary uh, equipment that we all need to uh, enable the world to continue to uh, have the necessary amenities. Particularly, I want to just address the length of the tour of beauty of seafarers as one of the biggest areas of concern. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, we still today are living in, the, in times where seafarers remain at sea long after the end of their tour of duty. So that concern is continuing in my view to grow. Um, I, I know it's not that easy, particularly, and that's what I want to focus on, particularly because the seafarers of this world are coming from the developing countries. And therefore, they normally to be able to join ships wherever they have to find that, get to that particular ship. They have to transit and transfer through airports, to ports of this world where they will join a particular ship. And just even enabling them to do that is itself one of a very big challenge. But the worst of all really is all those who have been at sea and have not been able to return home. We still have more than 20,000 seafarers who have not been, more than that, who have not been able 
to return home since the start of the pandemic. This is an issue of great concern. It's a mental health issue beyond being issues relating to working conditions. And so that is one significant issue that I think we need to, uh, in any you know, discussion in the panel, we need to actually take into account. The COVID-19 vaccinations, therefore, is critical. So one is then the, those have been at sea. The second issue is vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. How do our seafarers who are in a port for very short periods of time for that ship to move on again, how are they going to get vaccinated unless there is a global consensus around the world that in all ports of the world, seafarers should have access to the vaccines when their ships dock in the countries concerned. Get them vaccinated and they move on. Nowadays, we have a, there are a range of vaccinations that can be, can be, can be used. So that is a, a second concern in, in, in the fact that our seafarers are not, not enough of our seafarers. I know in some countries, uh, at least I think there are 24 countries to date that have agreed to uh, provide vaccination, 24 countries, only 24 countries. And so this is not enough. Seafarers are going, ships are going around the world and without shipping today, we will not have been able to continue to operate the way that we have managed it. It is the ships that have brought in the goods and the cargo that have enabled all countries around the world to have access to the commodities and the different things that we need, including the food that is brought in from, you know, let's say take Latin America to Europe where you, know, you go and buy them into the supermarket and you buy your orange and you buy all of these things. Where are they coming from? How do we get to stop to think about? This is only possible, not just because you have ships, but ships cannot go anywhere without, without people, without seafarers. And so that is a concern that I think that is still, we still have too many seafarers who are uh, still at sea and not being able to go home. So that's one concern. The second concern is really the access to medical care. Medical care, especially with the, the coronavirus, they should have access in all ports around the world to have priority access to vaccinations, to enable shipping to continue to do its own business. So, we still have about 250,000 seafarers coming from countries that have not been able to get home. 24 such countries of which I am aware. It is therefore, in my view, a, we need a clarion call to speed this up to ensure vaccination in all ports around the world where cargo is brought in and out. Of course, one of the concerns is in the developing world where, 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 where seafarers come from. They don't, still don't have access to the necessary vaccines that the developing world needs to vaccinate its own people. So how can they vaccinate? They can't even vaccinate their own people. How are they going to vaccinate? those seafarers in a port where the goods are from, where the goods are sourced to be carried to the developed world where the goods are consumed. This is, this is kind of an imbalance here that uh, I just, you know, of course it's, I don't know how to, how we can, how the United Nations system can work together to get that fixed. But of course, one of the things that I thought was extremely, it was, it was really, heartwarming and reassuring was the coming together of the entire United Nations system. The coming together, not just with the, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, Security Council and the, the General Assembly designated CFRs as key workers. Not, and that has been a major factor. Now, the one thing is to have it. The other thing is to make sure it is <laughs> realized from uh, you know, what is on as a text to what is done in practice. 
So COVID-19 vaccinations for me, and the reference was made to it earlier, is critical that if we want, and if we want both port transport, so both, both ships, and airplanes to fly, you know, because seafarers are off there, they must take an airplane to get to a port eventually <laughs> in another place, in another country. So both, I don't think we can think only about ships, we also have to think about uh, ports and about uh, air, airlines, you know, so airplanes to enable that uh, seamless uh, transit and transfer. But one important question is whether there has been a failure or not of maritime governance. Have the instruments that we have in place, are they effective enough? I would still say yes, but it, it's all about implementation. The instruments that exist today are up to date, are relevant. The question is transforming these instruments into real ratification by countries and the implementation once the ratification once ratification has been obtained. More ratifications need to come in. Even that pandemic, we, we should have had, I should have, we should have had to keep the Maritime Labor Convention as my example, the convention that I was, it's very close to my heart in which everybody labored so hard to make it. But there are still so many countries, only 98 countries have ratified this convention. That's not enough. The entire world today, particularly with, Mar with the issue of COVID-19 should have ratified the MLC, all countries around the world should have realized how dependent we are on shipping and those people who make shipping possible to enable, to enable them to be recognized in the countries where they come from, but also recognized outside in countries where their ships dock or uh, deliver goods and cargo. So this is this is uh, the one of the issues I wanted to uh, really raise in, in the discussions, uh, if, if there is a panel exchange, if that is possible or not. And I, I would finally, uh, so as to ensure that we all get a chance to speak, I would finally like to say that seafarers have faced significant challenges regarding access to shore leave, repatriation following their tour of duty, and importantly today, vaccinations. We have 24 countries that have agreed to vaccinate CFRs. That's not enough, 24 countries. That's just not enough to make sure that we can keep the global supply chain open. That's just not enough. And as a result, we will not be able to attract young people to the industry those that come and finish their tours of duty or those who have number of years and they want to go back out, back out, you know, they want to return home for good and, and leave shipping and leave, well, being at on board ships. We have to have new people coming in. We have to continue to encourage young people to go to sea. How are we going to do that? How are we today, of course, forget about women at sea. That we've lost, this, we, I think we're going to be losing the battle with women at sea. In this in this context as well. So these are some of the you know we can the some of the reflections that I've had and I wanted to share. A fair future for seafarers. For World Maritime Day theme of the IMO could not have been more pertinent. And relevant. The maritime sector, by designating seafarers as key workers. I mean, it is my hope that this endures and continue to have a positive and long-term impact on the maritime industry. And we need that if we want to attract young people to go to sea, young people to opt for a career at sea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor uh, Dumbia Henry for bringing in this uh, very, very critical issue of the seafarers predicament. You are on the spot. Vaccination rates of seafarers is around 41% in November, and this is not acceptable. As you said, vaccination in all ports should be mandatory. It's, it's sad that this is not taking place. 
And it is also concerning, as you said, there are instruments are out there, but the ratification and implementation of these instruments is what we need now. And this would have been a very good opportunity to do that. But, you know, we are still in this uh, pandemic. As, you know, time has not run out of uh, us yet. I think uh, there should be a, a, a global collective action towards easing the seafarers' lives because they are truly essential for the world's uh, trade. Thank you so much. So let me, Jan, can I please ask you now to take over and then see whether we have, a, can we get a quick round of Q&A? Yeah, thank you very much, Shamika. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Uh, really very, very happy to have these very insightful uh, comments, uh, discussions, and through the chat, through the Q&A, and actually also through other channels from WhatsApp to email, we got a number of questions, which I've tried to group into three clusters of questions. Uh, the first one, there were Osman, Mustafa, others on, which I would uh, call like the energy transition. Now, how can we ensure the necessary energy transition, which OSG also highlighted like the, the biggest challenge in terms of transition of the, the industry without incurring too high costs. Uh, several countries who were here on the panel have signed the, the Dhaka Glasgow declaration in, in Glasgow, which promotes looking into the possibility of a levy that would make uh, alternative fuels competitive and at the same time generate funds to, to help those for whom these costs would otherwise be too high. That's, that's one set of questions on the energy transition. The second one, uh, there were Siad, Eno and others on, on the geography of trade, near shoring, closer um, uh, regional integration. There's the African continental free trade area where we really have some hope that maritime can benefit from this. So how can we uh, ensure that maritime benefits and contributes to this with short sea shipping, with intermodal connections and, and this type of regional collaboration. The third, third set is about the human element, including seafarers, uh, capacity building also in the wider maritime business. So how can we all level up capacity building support um, to get young people into the industry, um, have women participate, uh, yeah, for the industry and also to make sure that this industry remains competitive. In all three of these three um, sets, I think a common theme is this widening gap and the challenge to ensure that the most vulnerable uh, countries, populations, there's a shipping connectivity divide, which we have monitored for the last 15 years, like some countries get better and better connected, others um, are, yeah, are really, really stuck. Vaccination, a divide, energy transition, there's a divide. So I think that's, of course, also where Anktat comes in. We want to promote development globally and especially help in this uh, dear maritime sector to help the most vulnerable. So that's my attempt of grouping these different questions we received. And uh, yeah, the moderator will have to find the answers. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. I think these are very big questions. I think we probably can spend uh, days and months on these questions, but could I please turn to our panelist, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Moon, would you, would, would you want to address, take up some of these questions and also give your closing remarks in a couple of minutes? Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, well, those uh, three items that uh, uh, Dr. Jan Hoffman just mentioned um, energy transition, uh, geography of trade, and uh, human element, important human element in shipping uh, business. I'm fully agreeable with them on those uh, three items that he, he has just mentioned. And uh, well, uh, as you have rightly mentioned, if he uh, discuss uh, these three items, even these three items, it takes uh, days, months, and even years. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm hundred percent sure that uh, it'll take a lot of time. And uh, well, when it comes to energy transition, 
we are very much encouraging a uh, Korean shipping company to use more, um, um, less uh, CO2 uh, fuel, let's say uh, uh, in, in the short time period, in, in the mid-term in transitional uh, period, I mean, uh, uh, for example, LNG, uh, uh, even though it's uh, still uh, produce uh, some amount of uh, uh, CO2, but uh, it's much uh, useful for shipping company to come to this, uh, CO2 free energy in the years to come as a transitional period. And uh, of ultimately, we are targeting uh, the CO2 free energy, uh, for example, hydrogen, so that uh, um, um, shipping company uh, can be a uh, contributor to so-called uh, non-CO2 world um, after 2050. Even, for example, um, Korean company HMM, uh, they declared uh, uh, at the uh, P4G uh, summit in Seoul last May that uh, they are going to be aiming at the uh, CO2 free uh, company uh, by the time uh, 2050. So uh, particularly, I'd like to highlight that point amongst the others. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, three items that Dr. Jan Hoffman mentioned. And uh, capacity building also important for us to attract more young people into the business. And um, geography of trade also important, but uh, even though I'd like to have uh, many things to say about on these items, but uh, <laughs> I have to stop <laughs> at this moment uh, so that uh, other participants can speak about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for this. Uh, you know, I mean, really, it's a sharing your own experience because if that's what we are looking for: sharing experience among countries and what has worked, what has not worked, and what can others replicate and adapt. So, thank you very much. And I am asking. I see Ambassador uh, Sperison and also Cleopatra. Would you like to take the floor? Uh, I think you can go to ambassador, the ambassador. Ambassador, please. Ambassador, you're on mute. Sorry, I hope it's better now. Yeah, yes. good. Uh, I think uh, all the three questions are very important and very interesting. Uh, from our perspective, of course, we are basically uh, not uh, a big, uh, we don't have a big industry or, or a shipping industry. So we are basically on the side of the users. And for us, it's very important that the work that Hotot is doing on this and to focus on especially some issues on uh, uh, capacity building and, and finding ways how this will develop and how we can uh, participate in reducing the, the high cost of shipping. Because in, in our cases, uh, one, the percentage that uh, our products get to the consumer outside Guatemala is basically a big part of its transport. And I think this is why we are very interested to collaborate in the future with, uh, with on, that, on, on this issue and see how in all this ways probably together with other countries similar as Guatemala can contribute to finding ways to solve this problem in the short term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think I fully agree. You know, you, you know, you may, may not be the ship owners, ship builders and the ship, you know, uh, uh, ship operators, but you know, many countries are users of these services. So they are, uh, there's a concern uh, when the freight rates go up and then they, you know, stay up. This is a big concern. So capacity building initiatives, we are very well, uh, you know, we, we take on board your comments. Uh, SG, would you like to uh, uh, conclude? Okay, so let me then give to uh, Cleopatra, would you like to add a few uh, sentences? Yes, I, I think what I would like to say is to highlight really right now is the importance of ramping up 
vaccination for CFRs. This is really the last thing I want to say. And it is extremely important if we want global trade to continue to run smoothly. CFRs today are coming from the developing world, I insist on indicating there. And still in many of the countries in the developing world from where they would have to go back to get vaccinations would be either on not available um, and certainly, you know, getting getting themselves identified as except if they're coming from very big countries like we're gonna have massive numbers of CFR residents take Indonesia, take the Philippines, India, you know, these these countries have huge numbers of CFR at sea. But how many, you know, CFRs remain at sea, and uh, especially during this pandemic, now for more than 14 months at sea, more than that, maximum number of months at sea. Uh, and so I think it is extremely important that we ramp up, we continue with the message of ensuring that wherever ships dock in countries, particularly in the developed world, the opportunity should be given to ensure that they uh, they get access to the vaccinations as soon as their ships arrive in a port. How do we get that? I mean, through IMO, through the ILO, through the United Nations system itself, the UN uh, itself. I think together they must make a big plea that all countries should immediately uh, identify those those CFRs who are still awaiting vaccinations so that global the global supply chain can remain open. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. I think these are wise words and I think uh, the, the, the importance is to keep the global supply chains open and make sure ships uh, uh, continue to function the seafarers, lives are facilitated and uh, so we can, as you said, you know, we can go to the grocery shops and get our groceries without thinking where these things come from. But I think this, this, this crisis has been a real eye opener to understand how important the functioning of the maritime transport sector. So please be assured that we will have a lot more analysis of the current crisis, what are the steps that need to take in the short term, and also how to future proof the maritime sector as we go forward and the big issues you addressed, many of you, the digitalization, the automation, the big ships, uh, uh, decarbonization, these are all issues that we need to address collectively. So please watch out for, the, for this uh, space of UNCTAD. We, in, in the coming months, we will be doing a lot of work on listening to experts, collating information, uh, you know, going deeper and unpacking some of these complex issues and getting back to you. So having said that, it's 11.29. So I think we have come to the end of this session and thank you so much for being with us. And it has been a truly a very insightful uh, conversation. Thank you everyone and a, and a very big applause to all of you. Thank you. So take care everyone and keep safe. Oh, Cleo, thank yes. you. Hello, my <laughs> wonderful faculty member. Huh? All the best, all the best. Hoping well, you know, we're not going to be able to see each other, unfortunately, okay. because of COVID-19 again. No, and we were hoping okay. that you have been able to come and meet and see us. But you know, life is like it is. So hopefully next year. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> all the best. Cheers. Right. Thanks. Thank you all. Jan, thank you, Jan. Jan, thank you. Not just him. Not, uh, Jan, thank you very much, Jan. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.